Okay, here we go. Hi everyone, my name is Malek Kemal. I am a licensed psychologist. I'm the clinical director of Thrive Wellbeing Center, and I am an adjunct instructor at the American University of Sharjah. I'm so happy to be here today. Before we begin though, I do want to um, just kind of do a little bit of housekeeping. So I'm going to pin the topic of this discussion. Give me one second and I'm gonna follow all the instructions. All right. Overcoming. Emotional eating. Welcome, welcome. As you guys are all coming in, I am very happy that you guys are um, finding your way in. Let me just find a way to pin it. Uh, ah, pin comment. There we go. Yes, pinned. Okay, there we go. All right, overcoming emotional eating. And let me just see, how are we doing? Does that look all right? Okay, more people are rolling in. Welcome, welcome, and a wave to all of you guys as well. Okay, so let's begin. Uh, just very quickly, again, very briefly, an introduction. My name is Malak Kamel. I'm a licensed psychologist clinical director at Thrive Wellbeing Center and um, adjunct instructor of psychology at the American University of Sharjah. So today, what are we going to be talking about? First and foremost, actually, I just want to um, give my thanks actually to uh, the Happy UAE team, um, everybody who collaborated and organized everything and, and just the, the initiative in and of itself. It's actually a, a really big honor and, and pleasure to be part of this uh, very essential initiative, um, both nationally and, and globally, uh, actually. All right, so today, what are we going to be talking about? Um, if any of you have, have kind of gotten a chance to see the little uh, video uh, promo, we mentioned three things. So we're going to be talking about emotional um, awareness, emotion regulation, and we're gonna be providing some mental and behavioral strategies for you to better uh, manage uh, emotional eating um, or kind of when it gets a, a little too excessive or out of hand um, during this, this time or any time really, okay? Um, we're gonna be covering those three topics. Um, and so some of you may be saying, maybe wondering or asking, is this talk for me? Should I tune in? Feel free to tune in if, if, you, if you like and, and feel free to, 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 to zone out and come back as you wish. Um, but uh, the topic and, and, and the talk is really for everyone. Um, it, it is applicable to all age groups. Um, so, you know, youth, adults, um, women and men as well. I just, I want to kind of make that clear so we, we don't think that this is just a gender specific discussion. It's not at all actually. So it's applicable to, to anyone and everyone really. So feel free uh, to, to tune in and stay tuned in uh, if it interests you. Okay, so why this topic? Um, a few reasons. One is it is a challenging time it is definitely a challenging time for um, many of us and for for most of us. And I, I think we all can say that some days are, are better than others or, or some days are worse than others. Um, but I think what's really, um, what we can all agree on is that it's a very emotional time. And with emotion, uh, a lot of us find ourselves kind of when trying to manage emotion, we find ourselves uh, in many moments kind of gearing towards uh, food. And we're going to be talking about why we may do so and how to kind of manage that in a healthy, uh, in a healthy way. But I guess one of the, the, the ideas and the reasons uh, in kind of putting this talk together is that there's been a kind of a lot of discussion in the general public about kind of this tendency to, to, to find ourselves gearing towards or, or going towards food to manage kind of what it is that we're feeling. In that sense as well, uh, we've been finding that people have kind of been, you know, reporting that they don't feel too good about their, their body and their body image and how they feel. Part of that is 
a little bit of the you know emotional eating but another part is not having the ability or flexibility to move right and to move around as we're locked and in quarantine and all that kind of stuff which is really important and essential and you know it is uh, essential for our safety but it does have an impact right so and I, and I, and i think we realize here that food and uh, you know food and eating isn't the only kind of component of body image and body appearance um but we actually just kind of wanted to um create a discussion around this in a way that's informative and in a way that is uh, proactive and provides you with um good insight knowledge and educates you in a way that you can actually tackle any um, issues that you're struggling with and kind of get a sense or regain a sense of comfort um, in a healthy way, at least when it comes to how you nourish your, yourself and your body, if that makes sense. Okay, uh, the third reason that I have for me, uh, for myself, is um, it's a general kind of focus on health. So health is wealth, right? Or health is our... Is, is kind of uh, our biggest um, asset. So what we want to talk about today is not just your physical health, but also your emotional health and your mental health. And that's kind of the idea behind this whole campaign, which is wonderful. Um, and so we're kind of linking both of those together when we're talking about emotional eating and, and trying to understand kind of uh, the this interesting dynamic and interplay. All right. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing. Uh, an agenda. For the agenda, we're going to start with talking a little bit. We're going to do a very brief uh, word on hunger. Okay. Then we're going to jump into emotional awareness. So we're going to be talking about the emotional eating cycle. What is it? What are the components of it? What happens? Uh, why do we find ourselves in it? And then we're going to be talking about emotion regulation. So when I'm in this cycle, what do I do? How, how do I navigate <laughs> what's going on? Um, and we're also going to be then kind of going into the strategies piece. And for the strategies, we have the mental and the behavioral strategies. And I have actually a uh, nice surprise for you guys, wherein I have a guest speaker who's going to join us towards the very end for the last kind of like five or 10 minutes, um, five or 10 minute stretch. And since, uh, so this is a little surprise for you guys, hopefully it goes well and we can have her connect pretty easily. Um, I think one of the most interesting elements of this surprise is that I'm going to be calling her using uh, my house phone. And some of you may say, you have a house phone? It, it surprises me as well. So you can't have two people on Instagram uh, live at the same time. So I'm actually going to be calling her from my house phone, which seems to be an antique at the moment. So um we're going to be using that so hopefully that goes well and that will cover the entertainment value for uh, for the for your one hour uh, discussion today okay so we're going to begin and as my university students know whenever i take off my watch and set it down to try to keep track of time that's when they know we're going to begin all right okay so let's begin. We said we'd start with kind of a very brief word on hunger, okay? So when we talk about hunger, I want you to think of the word and of the experience. Um, hunger. What does hunger mean to you? When you think of hunger, do you think kind of of that physical sensation? Or do you think of appetite? What about the word craving? So when we come to talk about hunger, we, we understand and I guess we just need to kind of remind ourselves without going into too, too much detail, but we kind of need to, to, to remind ourselves that hunger is both a physical and a physiological experience, right? Um, but it's also definitely an emotional one. Right? And we need to kind of keep that in mind that it is um, natural for it to be uh, an emotional uh, experience. It's just a matter of how much of that experience takes over the whole experience, right? So that's kind of something for us to keep in mind. Hunger is both a physical and um, psychological 
it's both a physical and physiological and um, psychological experience. And so what we're taking a look at today is kind of the interplay of both of those, okay? There are several different types of hunger. So there are seven types of hunger, okay? There is eye hunger, nose hunger, mouth hunger, and each of those kind of are pretty self-explanatory. When, you're, when, you're, when you see something, you go, ooh, I want that, right? Or when you're walking you know, around somewhere and you smell something, you say, hmm, I'd like to have a bite of that, right? Or mouth hunger, when we just feel like we need to crunch on something, right? Um, so we said, I know mouth. Um, we have stomach hunger, which is actual kind of physical, that physical kind of um, hunger. We have mind hunger. And mind hunger, kind of an example of that would be saying, you know, oh, it, I woke up in the morning, here I am, it's morning time, I guess I must have breakfast, even though one may not necessarily be hungry in that immediate moment, right? Or one saying, oh, I'm, you know, it's, it's uh, everybody's uh, eating around me, I guess I, I'll do the same as well, right? There is cellular hunger and there is heart hunger. And cellular hunger is kind of when your, your body is actually craving. There's something that's happening on that kind of cellular, almost molecular level where your body is really craving um, that kind of uh, food, for example. Okay? And then there's heart hunger. And by heart hunger, this is kind of what we mean and, and what translates into emotional hunger, okay? And we mentioned before that emotional hunger um, is a type of hunger and so it's, it's normal, right? It's a normal experience and it's really important for us to, you know, I, I know I've stated that before and I know I'm kind of stating it again and I will say it over and over again as well because I want to, it's important for us to normalize it and it's important for us to know that it is a normal and uh, okay experience, right? The only concern is when we engage in any type of hunger, be that anything other than stomach really, um, most of the time, or it takes up too much of our time. And we're actually not necessarily, we end up not necessarily feeding ourselves with the kind of, um, you know, for our health uh, and, and nutrition, but rather um, for a bunch of other reasons, right? To feed that kind of heart hunger or mind hunger or eye hunger or nose hunger and so on and so forth, okay? So generally, health practitioners and nutritionists will say, um, and dietitians will say that there generally is a 70-30 uh, rule, wherein most of the time, at 70%, most of the time, you should be eating because your stomach and your body actually requires it. The rest is allowed, but it should be taking that 30%, not the other way around, okay? So that's kind of the idea here and just a, a quick word on hunger. Moving on from there, if we're talking about kind of, there we go. Um, if we're talking about this idea of uh, heart hunger and, and emotional hunger, it brings us to the question of what is the emotional eating cycle? Okay, so I'm going to walk you through this cycle, and we're actually going to walk through this cycle several times. We're going to walk through it once now as it is, and then we're going to walk through it again with a couple of different lenses and a couple of different layers as we go through our chat and discussion today um, so that we can build on the knowledge that we have um, to be able to kind of add that element of awareness and regulation uh, beyond just kind of knowledge. It, it'll make sense in a little bit. Um, okay, so let's start with the emotional eating cycle. The cycle begins first with um, an event, an event or a situation that causes some type of stress, okay? Or some type of situation that is upsetting. Some type of or other, another word would be discomfort, okay? So something happens that is upsetting, distressing, discomforting, okay? Second, the individual then 
um, finds themselves urging for and having this sometimes it's an overwhelming urge and sometimes it's an undertone <laughs> it doesn't have to be overwhelming sometimes it can it can be an undertone but there is a urge of sorts to resort to food or to eating okay the person eats the individual kind of eats and at times that eating experience is more than one needs, right? More than is needed kind of, you know, in the, in the sense of kind of that physical, um, physical satiation. So what happens afterwards, the fourth kind of um, stage or step in that uh, cycle is an experience of guilt, an experience of shame. Yet another experience of discomfort, but this time it's a different discomfort, right? Or at least maybe different kind of from what initially started um, the cycle. The additional piece here is that the individual may feel kind of powerless over food. So this is kind of the general cycle. Now let's take a look at the cycle once more from the perspective of what might be happening um, in terms of kind of the mental process. So what might be happening kind of on the level of the psyche as we go through this process, okay? So we mentioned that the first experience is kind of this discomfort, right? There is a discomfort of sorts that, uh, that one feels because of a certain event happening around them, okay? Or a certain, it could be an event that triggered it, right? It could be a certain relationship that triggered it. Um, could be an emotion in and of itself um, that triggered it, right? So there's some kind of discomfort. And one of the things for us to keep in mind is there's a range of discomfort, right? You know, there's things range from unease, discomfort, maybe all the way to pain, right? So there's, there's a range here. And it's important for, for one to kind of keep in mind where they are on that range. When we talk, we're going to talk a, a little bit later on about kind of tuning into that and tuning into what's happening in that moment so that you can have a good idea kind of of, of the intensity of what's going on at that moment um, when you are kind of acting as the detective who is looking for clues and patterns. We're going to get to that in a little bit. So there's an experience of discomfort, right? A mental and emotional discomfort. And so step two here is really about you seeking comfort. There is comfort that is being sought to kind of um, counteract the discomfort. Makes absolute sense, right? The issue is that the comfort that is being sought is sought directly with and through the avenue kind of of that, that feeding experience, right? So sometimes we seek too much comfort, right? And that might be part of that overfeeding, right? An overeating experience, right? And afterwards, that fourth kind of step that we spoke about or that fourth kind of um, um, phase or stage in the cycle right? The one that we spoke about that has kind of to do with that guilt or, to, you know, um, and feeling ashamed and feeling powerless. A lot of that might very much be related to, wait a second, I still feel some discomfort. Was that really the comfort that I needed? And so there's a part of the psyche that kind of recognizes that and that recognizes that, hmm, that did in some ways feel good for a certain period of time, but is that really what I was looking for? Is that really what I needed? Okay. And so that kind of helps us understand that cycle from the perspective of the psyche, if that makes sense. Okay. So why do we find ourselves in, um, why do we find ourselves in this cycle to begin with? Why do we find ourselves seeking, um, seeking comfort through that avenue of food. Think about it. What might be some of the things that contribute to that? What might be some of the things that kind of contribute to, you know, when there is that, that first part of the cycle, right? The emotional eating cycle, there's some kind of distress or discomfort. 
And one says, ooh, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. I don't like how this feels. I need something to soothe me, right? What might be some of the things that contribute to, you know, the mind, right? Or I guess at times even the nose, <laughs> right? Or the eyes or the heart. Remember, we mentioned all these different types of hunger, right? What might be some of the things that contribute to, to us going towards the direction of food? I'll give you a second to think about it. One of the things that most contributes to it is that um, food is comforting. <laughs> And we kind of learned that from a very, very young age, right? Think about our infancy. Think about when we were first born, right? And think about that stage of development that we all went through, right? We just can't, can't seem to, to, to remember it. That, by the way, is called infantile amnesia. Um, events that occurred that you don't really uh, remember or recognize uh, because they probably occurred before a certain age. So, you know, as infants, we were all uh, seeking um, comfort. And one of those ways, other than touch and care, right? One of those ways was feeding, right? And until now, food is comforting. But I guess what's important for us to kind of take a look at and to kind of try as much as we can to remind ourselves in this kind of process of trying to better understand the emotional eating cycle and how to navigate it is how we need to be finding other avenues for comfort, ones that are actually going to help break that cycle from it ending with, you know, stage number four, which is us still feeling discomfort in the end after all, right? That's, uh, that's one thing. Another is past associations. Okay, so what we mean by associations is it's, it's quite simple. When two, uh, um, two things are associated with one another, it's one of the ways that we learn, actually. We experience cognitive learning and we also learn by association. Um, and many of you may have heard of the term conditioning. If you haven't, um, there are different types of uh, uh, learning that we experience through things that are conditioned around us. So there is an experience, for example, of learning through classical conditioning. Um, through operant conditioning, right? And so in classical conditioning, you may find, um, in classical conditioning, you may find the experience of a stimulus, right? And your response to that stimulus, both of which you can't really control, being associated and paired with one another. So let's give the example of um, cookies, okay? How a cookie smells and the fact that you go, mm, that smells good, are both two things that you can't really control per se, right? But you make a pairing and an association here. There's also the experience kind of of operant conditioning, okay? That's another form of an associ association. But in, in operant conditioning, you do kind of have a role and a part to play. So you operate and behave a certain way and the environment kind of responds to your behavior. And based on that, you learn something. So for example, a child who says, please, please, pretty, please, 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 pretty, please. And then the parent says, fine, because you said, please, here you go, here's your cookie. They may learn to associate, please, 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 with obtaining that reward. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is these experiences of associations be through classical conditioning, operant conditioning, whatever kind of um, experience of uh, all the different types of associations that you may have experienced, um, they contribute very much to this idea of us associating food with comfort. And so I encourage you um, to kind of take a look and reflect um, on what that might look like for you and for your own experiences. Another one, another thing kind of to take into consideration is emotional history. So some people kind of say, well, what about my past? What does, you know, how does my past kind of, what does my past say about my current emotional eating and, and what that means and how is there a link here? I will say that, of course, you know, whenever we talk about past, we have to kind of take into uh, consideration the individual experience, right? So there's a lot of, um, I'm, I'm not a fan of blanket statements, especially when it comes to the past. But what I will say is that 
it is helpful for us to look into the past, absolutely, but it's helpful to go into the past with a purpose. So it's helpful for us to go into the past to understand a little bit, again, about past associations, about childhood experiences, about all of that kind of stuff when it comes to food and emotions, to take what we need from the past, see how it impacts the present and move on and see how we're taking a look forward into the future. It's not very helpful for us to go into the past and just stay there, right? So um, that's something kind of a note on this idea of past and past experiences. Um, very, very important for us to take a look at that, but you know, not so helpful if we just stay there uh, you know, for days on end without purpose, right? So that's something kind of to take a look at. So I guess as we're kind of closing up this idea of the importance of emotional awareness, you know, what we're talking about here and how we're looping all of this together, the topic of the discussion is emotional eating. But in truth, kind of taking a look at kind of what we mentioned before in terms of um, seeking comfort, this idea of associations, this idea of past, it can be helpful whether we're talking about the, you know, this idea of somebody seeking comfort through food or through anything else, right? So this is kind of the, the idea of the use of emotional awareness across so many different um, issues and challenges, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and I think now we can probably move on to the actual emotional regulation. So what do we do when we're actually in the cycle? First of all, when you notice that you're in that middle of that emotional eating cycle, don't panic, right? Like, just take a deep breath, don't panic, you can choose to act and, and try to take charge in that moment, or you can choose not to. It's fine. You don't have to, you know, notice that this is happening and say, stop, you know, and throw the, you know, and throw the fork and run away. And it's, it's fine. Again, remember that you have that, there's that 30% kind of, allow yourself a little bit of that kind of, um, you know, leeway. The problem becomes when this is the only way that you are seeking comfort or when this is occurring, that 70% rather than the actual 30, the allotted 30 that it should be, okay? So what do we do when we're kind of in that cycle? Approach it calmly, I would say, or decide, and that could be in that moment or perhaps afterwards. Um, to kind of take, a, take a, a moment to say, okay, let me walk through the cycle and see what exactly I was experiencing emotionally and what I was doing behaviorally and what the triggers were in my environment that contributed to all of this. You don't have to do it on the spot. You can reflect on this afterwards, okay? You have the time to do so. So when we talk about emotion regulation, what is emotion regulation? Emotion regulation really is your ability to be able to um, manage a situation with all of the complexity of the emotion that comes with it. The emotion that's evoked, the emotion that one may say, oof, I should inhibit this or I should manage this in a certain way, right? So emotion regulation is kind of the, the art of knowing how to manage and regulate your emotion. It's obviously a complex process, but it's also one that it's a muscle. So it's, it's kind of one of the, and it's a skill and, and, and a muscle really. So it's one of those processes that, you know, once you kind of understand how to tune in emotionally, and once you can actually start hearing and recognizing the emotion, so you might be like to, learning how to hear and tune into your thoughts properly or see with your mind's eye uh, the emotion or see things in your environment, the triggers maybe, um, you can kind of have a much stronger grasp on your ability to regulate your emotion. So generally the emotion regulation model will, will talk about the fact that there's a situation. I'm, I'm gonna really simplify it here. It's much more complex like, than this, I have to say. But they, they will say that, you know, the, the, the model speaks about this idea of there's a situation and there is kind of what we appraise to that situation in terms of certain thoughts or emotions. And afterwards there is our response to it. 
So there's a certain situation. What do I kind of attribute thoughts and feelings wise to it? And then how do I respond behaviorally, right? And so that kind of comes very nicely with this idea of emotional eating and the emotional eating cycle. So if we take some of that emotion regulation piece and kind of map it out nicely onto the emotion um, eating, uh, emotional eating cycle, here's where we come to the actual kind of, we start, kind of start to get into the, the strategies. Um, but more specific kind of to um, the cycle, and then we'll go into more general strategies. Okay, so there's a stressor. There's a stressor or a situation in your home that may have happened, okay? Or in your environment, in your day-to-day -day experience that may have happened. So I encourage you to ask and to notice kind of once you've maybe have gone to, kind of either gotten into that experience of emotional eating or again could be done afterwards you know no there's there's no rush here <laughs> um the idea is for you to um to learn rather than to judge and for you to approach this um calmly in a way there's no battle here okay uh you're the only person who has something to gain and and uh, from this uh, you know inwards kind of introspection and experience so when we take a look at the stressor, we need to be asking, what is it that I'm doing? Or what is it that I was doing? Where was I? Who was I with? Who was around me? Who was in my mind's eye, right? Maybe nobody was around you, but in your mind's eye, <laughs> right? Or in your mind or in your thoughts, there was somebody there. Um, and I'm going to speak about this idea of somebody there because one of the things I, I want to make a very clear note on is, you know, um, it's, it's not so much that the person is the stressor, but rather the relationship. So we should keep that kind of in mind that perhaps it's the relationship that could be contributing to that stressor rather than the person, him or herself, right? Or our idea of the relationship or our perception of it, okay? So I guess try to kind of get as much info as you can about the stressor or the stressful experience that kind of triggered this whole cycle to begin with, okay? The emotion. What is the emotion that underlies discomfort? So here discomfort and the term discomfort or I feel angry, sad, happy, mad. Those are kind of primary emotions, kind of like primary colors. Let's go deeper than that. Let's, let's get a bit more colorful than that, okay? Um, furious? Isolated? Disappointed? Confused? Um, feeling like I don't know what's coming next? Nervous as to how I'm going to manage? Try to go deeper in identifying what actually is happening on that emotional level other than just you know i'm upset i'm angry i'm sad right try to go give yourself a bit more credit and try to kind of go deeper in that emotion um similarly by the way when you think of your happy emotions there it has many it's also quite colorful as well so there's more than just happy there is a uh, feeling uh you know curious interested uh feeling cheeky um um, so many different emotions. So anyways, try as much as you can, you know, if you need the, the use and assistance of a feelings chart, go for it. Um, when noticing kind of that emotion, first thing to do would, first and best thing to do would probably be to take a deep breath in, deep breath out, and try to kind of, um, um, regulate physically, uh, the body and the autonomic nervous system, uh, which is probably at that point quite nervous and, and acting up. Seeking comfort. So, based on the information that you are going to be gathering from the emotion, you're going to find out what it is that you might need to do to seek comfort. So, the more colorful and the more data, the more colorful the emotion or the more depth you are able to go, you are more likely then going to be able to come up with a more appropriate or a better or a more reflective um, option, solution, strategy for that comfort or to ease that discomfort, okay? So, you know, whether that's one needs a break, a nourishment, a, 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 
fresh air, uh, uh, needing to move maybe more towards acceptance, whatever it is that you find might make more sense to you. Now, lastly, when it comes to feeling guilt and this idea of, you know, that last stage that we spoke about um, in the emotional eating cycle, this idea of, you know, the experience of guilt and feeling what, like one is powerless over the food and whatnot. First of all, it's important, as we mentioned, not to judge the experience. The idea here is to process it and move forward and to look ahead. Um, we have to do so mindfully and we have to do so with a little bit of responsibility. So, of course, you might, you know, then say, I, how do I prepare for the next time around? How do I manage and kind of organize my environment in a way that it doesn't trigger me as much? Right. Or how do I prepare in advance? Right. And this is kind of this idea of prevention, because it's not just about the awareness and the intervention on the spot. It's also about prevention. That's being one step ahead of the game. So how, do, how can I also kind of, you know, appease or deal with some of these challenging feelings um, by doing my best to kind of prepare the environment um, as best as I can by removing some of the stressors in it, really? The third thing, really, that I would say about that phase and that stage is lean in on those around you for support, be they physically around you or virtually around you, right? Lean in on them for support um, in the sense of kind of letting them know what you are planning to do or what you would need some assistance and support in doing um, to implement kind of and provide an environment that makes a lot more sense for you, um, kind of to manage your ability to regulate your emotions better um, and specifically maybe as it pertains to kind of that emotional eating um, challenge that we're talking about, okay? So that's it for emotional emotion regulation. Um, I guess maybe I'll run through, I know we've spoken about, you know, strategies overall in the sense of each one of those sections in and of itself has strategies, but maybe I'll just use the last few minutes to summarize. And then we're going to give Maria a call, as I mentioned, um, on my house phone, which I think is probably going to be a pretty funny experience for us all. But very quickly, <laughs> um, so let's try as much as we can to shift kind of from an emotional eating cycle to a mindful eating cycle in a way, right? Um, to shift kind of in asking ourselves a bunch of different questions. You may ask yourself, wait, when do I usually want to eat during this cycle? What do I eat? What do I crave? How do I eat? Where do I eat? Gather all that information, gather that data. Learn to identify the emotion that's underneath that discomfort. We spoke about that. And demonstrate self-compassion. Um, allow yourself that 30% when, when you do enjoy it. And when it goes over that 30%, I mean, we have to keep in mind as well, given everything that's happening around us, it makes sense if we need a little bit of extra emotional kind of um, uh, nurturance. The only thing is we just have to make sure that it doesn't come at the expense of our physical and our mental health. Okay, so just keep that in mind. In terms of behavioral uh, strategies, I would say the main thing would be to really focus on your environment and focus on how you can manage and, and prepare your environment in a way that uh, will be a lot more supportive for you and, and for the process to begin with, okay? Um, get moving. Move as much as you can. I know we are all confined and, you know, not everybody is in a big home or even if you are in a big home, you may, you may be in a certain part of that home. Regardless, you know, I understand that we're all physically, um, you know, um, we don't have the, the same liberties to move physically, but find a way within your space to try to get moving as much as you can. Okay. Um, the other thing is take proper meal breaks. So sit down and eat your food without screen time, without, you know, unnecessary screen time. If the screen time is you having a meal with somebody, that's quite different than the screen time being you just kind of mindlessly, you know, uh, watching um, something kind of all you mindlessly, uh, you know, consume. 
again, keep in mind the 30, the 70, 30 rule, but I'm talking about this, if this is done kind of, uh, beyond that or in excess. Okay. Um, <clears throat> nourish your body yourself as much as you can cook for yourself. Actually, when you cook, uh, and make food yourself, it tastes completely different. Um, it tastes better. Usually some people may say, yeah, it tastes different because it doesn't taste good, but you know, the idea here is to, to, to learn how to, to eat and to nourish, um, uh, how to cook and, and to nourish yourself well. Um, so that's the idea here. Okay. I hope that was helpful. I feel like I, I, you know, I'm rushing here for time, but we're just, just on time. Okay. So we're going to give Maria a call and I'm going to put her on speakerphone and you guys can all laugh and smile at me. Um, because I have a house phone. We're going to put her on speaker. Here we go. Let's see. Let's try to get this going. Just the sound of the beeping in and of itself is quite funny. <laughs> Hopefully that works. Believe it or not. I think it may not be working. Okay, I'm gonna try once more. This might be the charm. And then if not, that's okay. We can close up with a few other. Okay. Hello? Hello, hi Maria. Hello. So everybody, I have uh, with us Maria Abihanna, who is a clinical uh, dietitian and an eating disorder specialist. And she's got a couple of nutritional strategies for us. Uh, we've got about, let's say, five or so minutes. How does that sound, Maria? That's fine. I'll make it a bit quick. Okay. Um, I'll start with the most important ones, just in case you run out of time. Thank you. Um, so the first, first, most important thing I think when it comes to managing cravings is it's important to remove all temptations from the house. Okay. So usually if you do have a weak spot for something, it makes sense not to always put it at least in big amounts in the house. Mm. Uh, stock up your fridge more with things like uh, yogurt, nuts, seeds, dark chocolate, healthier options so that when the cravings hit, you're not tempted to eat uh, the, uh, the things that you have a weak spot for. The second most important thing when it comes to cravings is it's important to give in sometimes. Uh, one of the biggest mistakes people do is they deprive themselves. Mm. And when you deprive yourself, you usually crave it even more. And you end up, rather than having a small piece of cake, for example, you end up having the whole cake. So they do say that the craving is usually satisfied with two bites. So next time you're craving a piece of cake, I would probably have two bites, stop, maybe pause for like five minutes and see if the craving has gone away or not. Mm -hmm. And if it hasn't, it's okay. You can go for another two bites. But most often we usually don't pause and I think that's very important to do. Mm. Uh, one more thing that's usually overlooked is how hydrated we are. So a lot of mm. times we mistake in hunger or cravings for thirst. So we're usually thirsty, but we think we're actually hungry. So also make sure you have a glass of water before you go for food. Herbal teas are generally known to reduce cravings. Things like ginger, lemon, peppermint, chamomile. And sometimes adding a bit of lemon and a teaspoon of honey will actually make the sweet craving disappear. Mm -hmm. Another good strategy I've also, uh, that I usually tell my clients is it's, it's also important sometimes to delay the craving and distract ourselves. Mm -hmm. So. Sometimes, you know, you can delay your craving five minutes or say you're going to have it the next day. And you'll actually realize that the craving is gone. Um, so delay, distract, um, and then, you know, if you feel like having it, that's fine. Um, sleep is also something that's usually overlooked. 
um, when we don't sleep enough, and by enough I mean at least six to eight hours a night, mm. our cravings for sugar, salt, and fat the next day are usually much higher. Mm. Um, so do make sure that you sleep enough and exercise, because exercise does reduce stress levels and it does improve our appetite usually. Um, so make sure you do get enough exercise. Sometimes if you are craving something, uh, training yourself to go for a walk or, you know, have a small 10 to 15 uh, workout routine at home will help reduce your craving. Okay. How am I doing, Malakon? You I- are doing wonderfully. I wanted to tell you, you have packed it in so nicely. <laughs> you packed it in so nicely. Thank you so much. It's uh, And it's actually really interesting, even kind of what you mentioned about sleep, because as as psychologists, we often ask about sleep because sleep for us is really a big window into um, mental health and well-being. And so it's interesting kind of that piece of information that you're giving us with regards to sleep and how it may influence cravings. So as usual, you're wonderful. Thank you so, so, Thank so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It was a great talk. All right. Okay. Thank you so much, Maria. Bye. Alrighty. Bye. So my phone got its, uh, my house phone got its uh, five minutes of fame. Okay, so to summarize, um, to summarize, emotional eating is normal. And there is that kind of 30-70 rule where it's important for you kind of to tune in to what type of hunger you're experiencing and what is kind of happening at that particular moment in time. We've spoken about the emotional eating cycle. We've mentioned, we've kind of walked through it from the perspective of the psyche and what's happening there. We've spoken about discomfort and actually seeking comfort and what might be contributing to um, our understanding of why we seek comfort through food. Or well, it's not such a bad thing, but when it kind of occurs a little too frequently, that's when it becomes a bit concerning. We spoke about kind of tapping into, uh, digging in a bit deeper in terms of emotions and understanding emotions and emotional uh, awareness. Um, and again, the more colorful the palette in the sense of you know, the, a little bit kind of the more digging a little bit, not too much, you know, no, let's, let's, let's be wise here and, and kind of use our mind with this, but generally kind of the deeper to a certain extent layers wise that you go in, in understanding or having a very good grasp of where you stand emotionally, the more likely it is that you will be able to provide the, the complementary kind of an, proper comfort. Okay. We've provided some behavioral and mental strategies and Maria provided some nutritional strategies. And I think that's about it. I just want to say, just remember your health is the main thing. Your health is actually your motivator. You're, you're, you should be motivated and your goal here is to be healthy, both physically and mentally. And that's really what it's all about. Okay. Okay. How are we doing on time? Yes. Just on time. It's all that practice with university, uh, I tell you. Okay, so just as I close off, um, some closing remarks. I want to thank, um, I want to thank Happy UAE for the opportunity. I want to thank Happy UAE and the UAE government in general for this amazing, amazing initiative. Um, again, I want to thank the, the, all the organizers and collaborators because they helped me, they walked me through every step of this process. Um, and you can imagine I needed a lot of guidance to do so. And actually, I also want to thank a lot of the other uh, speakers and contributors. Uh, follow the page. There's a lot of interesting um, and, and many talks a day, which is really nice. So there's a lot of content out there that's, that's helpful and applicable to anyone and everyone, really. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to thank you guys for tuning in. I, I, I want to thank you guys for tuning in, uh, for lasting however long you lasted. And I hope um, you found it helpful. And that's about it. Um, I think just one last thing. I just want to thank the people that are out there every day um, taking care of us. So are all of our frontline heroes, uh, not just here, but every in every single corner of the world. Um, so thank you to them. And that's about it. All right. 